nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Welcome everyone to a new installment of our hands-on workshop on machine learning. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Ryan Jacobs. Uh, Ryan did his undergraduate in at University of Minnesota. And um, after uh, working in industry, he uh, joined uh, University of Wisconsin at Madison, where he did his uh, graduate studies and now um, is a, a research associate, and he's uh, been one of the main developers of the tools that he's going to share with us uh, that are uh, tools that simplify the use of machine learning in areas of material science and, and related, uh, related areas. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing Ryan's presentation, and uh, Ryan, take it away. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Ale, for the introduction and the invitation. I'm really excited to be able to share some of our, you know, recent work on some machine learning toolkits and automation for uh, materials problems with such a large audience. Um, yeah, so our work on what we're calling the Material Simulation Toolkit for Machine Learning, or MassML, uh, has been a joint effort between researchers at University of Wisconsin-Madison um, and also some computer scientists at University of Kentucky. And we've also engaged a number of undergraduate researchers as part of uh, an NSF funded initiative called the Informatics Skunk Works Project. Um, and they've contributed in various ways to our code base as well. Um, and really the, the main idea here is wanting to automate the development uh, and evaluation of machine learning models from the particular viewpoint of materials property prediction uh, and supervised learning. Um, so just as a bit of motivation um, in, in preparing a review article from last year, we were sort of digging into, you know, what has been the trend of people publishing machine learning or materials informatics related research um, over time. And what we found, you know, going back to 2003, sort of a, a steady increase over time. And then, you know, around six or seven years ago, there's basically an explosion where we had a much faster increase in the number of publications per year. Um, and this inset shows a uh, number of review publications per year, which is also expanding very rapidly. Um, so, you know, there's clearly tremendous interest in various machine learning applications in material science, be it, you know, automatic detection of, of defect loops in microscopy images, or predicting materials properties with, say, random forest or neural network models. Um, and so there's a lot of diverse applications, and, and so we've tried to um, start to capture some of that functionality here. Um, so this is just an outline. It was actually shown by Ben in last week's seminar, but uh, for those who didn't see it, I still think it's a very nice illustration of sort of the general problem that we're faced with in, in a materials design sort of environment. Um, so this might consist of identifying a particular materials property that one is interested in, um, you know, be it the electronic band gap of a material or, or uh, formation enthalpy or an elastic constant, what have you. Um, and you want to train some model of, of these properties and then predict, uh, you know, new potentially promising materials compositions in a new space. And then based on those predictions, you know, perhaps follow it up with more careful experimental evaluation of new materials or simulations to, to sort of check your predictions. Um, so we have this sort of training loop uh, for machine learning model development where one needs training data, be it from simulation or experiment, um, maybe from some online materials database. It needs to pre be prepared in some, some way so that you know, there aren't missing values and that all the features you need are present. Uh, and then generally you need to um, turn what you have, say uh, materials composition or some structural information into uh, some encoding that a machine learning model can understand and represent. And so this is sort of this process of featureization or generating and, and uh, selecting features that, that you will use to predict a target property of interest. Um, so with that, you can uh, you know, fit and evaluate different types of machine learning models. This might be something extremely simple, like a linear regression model, or something very complex, like a, like a deep learning neural network. Um, 
with this, there's a, there's a certain, you know, I'm showing this as sort of a linear path, but really this is sort of an iterative process where one will evaluate and refine models in sort of an iterative way to, to find the best model and then make predictions uh, on some material space of interest. Um, so what is MassML and how does this fit into this process? Well, you know, we found that for any property of interest, there's a lot of repetitive tasks one performs with making features, selecting them, normalizing them in the right way, fitting different types of models and performing certain pieces of analysis or statistical calculation to understand the performance of a model. And so what we did is we developed this MassML toolkit, which is uh, sort of at its base, this open source Python package. It's on PyPy, so one can pip install it or, or use the GitHub repository. And then, you know, as we'll see today, we have this nano hub tool um, through Jupyter notebooks that one can use. Um, but it's, it was really designed to broaden and accelerate the use of these machine learning tools in material science, particularly for those who are non experts or, uh, you know, who may want to use machine learning tools, but don't want to go through the, the effort of, of coding up, a, you know, their own sort of pipeline and infrastructure. Um, so sort of at a higher level, you know, what I showed at uh, a couple slides ago with this with this process, MassML is really designed to automate different pieces of the supervised learning workflow. Um, and so, you know, these these different uh, sections are, are very reminiscent of what I showed a couple slides ago with some more details. Um, and I just want to touch on a few of these at sort of a high level. Um, you know, with with regard to uh, data, this is not just you know data one may upload from their computer. Um, but what we're trying to work on a lot is integrating uh, these these materials databases like materials data facility, uh, map miner, foundry, uh, materials project, and so forth, so that we can sort of have a a, a more seamless uh, integration of of these well used materials databases with our with our tools. Um, so you know once you have your your data uploaded and and sort of cleaned and ready to go, we offer sort of a, a number of different ways, which we'll walk through explicitly in the tutorial here soon, of uh, methods to generate features, be it from elemental properties or one hot encoding of different of different uh, chosen groups, um, methods to select most important features, and then sort of visualizing this process through say learning curves, where we look at the error in our model as a function of number of features or, or data points used. Um, the other thing that we'll look at after we generate a, a feature set for a data uh, for a set of data that I'll introduce in a couple of slides is we'll look at um, just a basic test of uh, you know random fivefold cross validation, which is sort of a, a baseline statistical test of model performance for a set of different models uh, that are based in the scikit-learn package, like kernel ridge regression, neural networks, Gaussian process regression, and so on. Um, one thing MassML allows for is sort of a automatic nested cross validation where one will leave out uh, uh, you know left out data sets and then perform the full iterative loop of selecting features training models optimizing hyperparameters and assessing model performance uh, in, in this this hierarchical way in an effort to to find the best model and have sort of an, an unbiased estimate of model performance um, one thing that we've been working on a lot is this notion of uncertainty quantification so this comes with, uh, you know, not only understanding what is the error of my model, but but what is the error bar on every data point that I predict. So not just a true value minus a predicted value, but an uncertainty in your predicted values. Um, so this is something that I'll touch on very briefly in, in the tutorial, and there is a full section of the tutorial that, that one can go over, um, you know, sort of on their own. It, it is more time consuming in its calculation, but you know, sort of doing this uncertainty quantification and, and domain model assessment is is a sort of a, a hot topic of research and it's very important to be able to understand you know whether whether the, the data you're predicting with a model can be reliable or not um, okay so um sort of a, a, a busy picture but pre presents sort of a high level um view of of how we sort of envision this code package interacting with other sections of of this workflow um, and in particular, MassML is meant to be a bridge between not only working with data, materials data from databases or from one's own computer in a way that's that's easy and, and uh, sort of seamless, but developing and evaluating machine learning models and then critically hosting them to, uh, if one desires to, hosting them on repositories that allow for 
other users to easily interact with your model, make predictions, uh, and so forth. And so sort of at a high level, we really view as MassML as sort of um, model building and evaluation, but then forming these sort of glue or key connections between uh, interacting with materials data and model hosting and sharing. Uh, and in particular, this model hosting and sharing component um, has really been brought to light by the fact that, uh, you know, in many machine learning models, um, uh, researchers will often say upload their models to to GitHub um, if they do that. Um, but oftentimes things will go out of date or they won't work with software updates or what have you. Um, and so this is a, a way we think not only to uh, draw more attention and impact to individual researchers work, um, but to facilitate easier um, uh, dissemination and reproduction of results and just model usability in general by having this infrastructure. Um, so the data that we'll be working with today in the tutorial um, is a set of diffusion coefficients of that were calculated uh, with um, quantum mechanical methods. If you're familiar with density functional theory, basically what it allows us to do in this particular case is simulate the metal crystal structure and the diffusion of impurity metal atoms through it. Um, this can be important for, say, alloy design. Um, and so the data that we'll be working with are different metallic hosts. Um, for example, it's shown on the right here as a copper host and a platinum host with different impurity elements in there. And the data that we're predicting are these activation energies or the energy required to move an impurity through this material. Um, so what we have is a database of about 440 values, but perhaps say you want to predict a much larger database. Um, and so to do this, we want to make a machine learning model where um, the target data or Y value are these activation energies um, that are sort of shifted to be relative to a host value. So we'll have negative and positive values. Um, the X values are the things that we fit to are elemental properties of the host and impurity elements, which we'll make in the first step of our tutorial. And then basically formulating the machine mo model is finding some function F that maps these descriptors X to the target property Y. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll try that out with a few different models and evaluate their performance with some cross-validation tests. Um, so with that, um, and I'll put, uh, Ben, maybe if you don't mind, you could put the, the link in the, in the chat to the tool if folks don't have it. But um, what I'm gonna do is pivot now to the, uh, the NanoHub tool tutorial um, shown here at this, this MassML tutorial. Uh, link. Uh, so if you uh, just you know enter this URL in your in your web browser, you'll be brought to um, our NanoHub launch tool page. Um, and um, so if you click on the launch tool, it will open up the tutorial. I'm just going to give a very brief overview about what the tutorial tool contains. Um, in general, there's a lot more material here than we can cover in in sort of the 45 minutes remaining in this tutorial. Um, a lot of it is because some of the runs will just take a while, but we do, I do have sort of expected output of what one should expect from each of these runs, um, though the precise output you get may, may differ. Um, so briefly, we just have uh, links here to our GitHub page for the code, um, the original paper that we wrote early last year, um, and the table of contents where we had six separate tutorials based on different um, sort of pieces of analysis that, that we can do with MassML. Um, what I'm actually going to start with is tutorial three, where we're going to import this diffusion data that I discussed briefly, and we're going to perform some uh, feature generation uh, and selection with those um, data. And then we're going to move into tutorial four, where we explicitly fit a number of models uh, and, and sort of check their analysis with fivefold cross validation. Um, and then time permitting, I'll discuss some aspects of some of the, the more advanced um, pieces of analysis, including you know, predicting left out data using nested cross validation, um, and then maybe some uncertainty quantification time permitting. Um, so I'd like, uh, at least what I'm going to do and, and what you can do if you wish is to just click on this tutorial three, which will bring us to um, uh, this section of the tutorial with, uh, each of these tasks related to uh, generating features and, and selecting them. Um, so this, this first uh, cell here will simply import, uh, and if you're not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, you can just do sort of a, a shift return and it will run the cell. Um, imports a number of 
MassML modules that we'll use in this tutorial. You'll see a couple of warning messages. Um, don't worry about them. They're just sort of notifying you of, of certain packages that, that um, are optional and, and won't impact this particular tutorial. Um, so this is just importing a few modules that we can use. Um, this next grant, this next cell, um, will actually just generate a MassML safe path. Um, so if we just run that, um, this will make a safe path, which will store all of our results too. Um, and the one way that we can see that is if we go to File, Open in our notebook environment, what it will open is um, this, this little Jupyter notebook window um, where we'll have this folder that we just generated called MassML Tutorial 3 Feature Engineering. Um, there'll be one data file in there for now. Um, in a moment, we'll have a number of other folders uh, and files in there. Um, but so this is a way that you can visualize some of the results because what will happen is many sort of data files and image files will be saved here. Um, and then towards the end, I'll, I'll show how one can download these data um, to your computer, which is also shown in the slides that, um, that were provided. Um, so the first step we want to do is import our data and then generate some features. Um, so we have this local data sets module, which um, basically just with providing a file path to the data, which I've included here, um, will sort of segment your data into the X features, the Y target data, and then a few extra um, groups based on uh, different categories of, of information you may provide. So one thing you need is the Y target data. Um, in this tutorial, um, we just call it e-regression. Um, so this is just the name of the, of the target data for the activation energies. Um, the other thing you need to provide, if it's sort of an optional thing, are extra columns. Um, these may be, you know, names of compositions or citations to papers or other information you have. It's basically additional information that isn't used in the um, model training directly. Um, so in our particular case, um, the model, the material compositions consist of the host and solute atom names that we have. Um, so we just define this local data sets module and provide um, the, the information that's shown here. Um, and what it does is it actually will load in a, a dictionary of the data using this load data method. Um, and from that, we can define our, our X feature data, our Y target data, the any extra columns that we have, uh, and then grouped columns. So groups will be useful later when we make one hot encoded features based on the host elements in our data set. Um, so if we just run this cell, um, what we can do since we defined our X feature matrix is just examine it in the output here. What we see is it's totally empty. Uh, which is okay because we're going to generate feature set for this um, particular run. Um, so to do that, if we scroll down here, um, the first set of features we're going to make are elemental based features. So these are things like, uh, you know, atomic radius or melting point, elastic constants, things like that, um, that are, you know, averages or mathematical manipulations of the composition of interest. So to do that, we have um, an elemental feature generator uh, module. Um, what it takes is um, the, uh, a data frame course, which contains the composition name so that it knows uh, the chemical formulas to use to generate the features. So this is where our extra data from our data set comes in handy because we are going to use a column where we had the host and solute material compositions joined together. Um, specifying feature types is optional, but this is basically just different mathematical manipulations of elemental features. So for instance, composition and arithmetic averages of, of the compositions, um, maximum and minimum values for each material, et cetera. Um, and so what this is going to do is it's going to return our featureized X data. Um, it'll just take a few moments. Um, and what I've shown here in this picture uh, obviously from my Mac, but we can see it in a moment in our save Jupyter environment, is it's going to generate a new folder called Elemental Feature Generator with a time st timestamp on it. And it will contain, um, you know, the, the, the featureized data file for further for future use, um, just as a reference. So this will just take a few seconds. Um, if we just look at back to our, our folder 
um, we'll see that you know this was created under our MassML tutorial three folder, um, and then when it's done, we'll have the the file here. So it is dropping a few columns that either had missing values or or constant values that aren't providing additional information. Um, but what we can do is we can well we, first of all we can see that the the file was was written to our safe path, so we can download that later. Um, if now we inspect the X data again, we'll see that. You know, we have a, a large number of features um, that, that spans quite a ways, but what we can see from below is that for our 408 data points, we have 404 uh, features that have been generated for us now. Um, so in addition to elemental features, you may want to generate other types of features. Uh, in this particular case, um, you know, we have these different uh, chemical groups based on the host element that we're interested in. Uh, and so we can generate one hot encoded features based on these group labels. Um, so we can just examine the groups that we have. Um, so they're contained in this material compositions one column. So we see that we have uh, 15 different unique groups, each corresponding to one of these metallic hosts. Um, so like the elemental feature generator case, there's sort of a basically a one line call to uh, implement a, a one hot group generator um, case. Um, so what this does is it just takes now the groups, uh, uh, information on the groups to specify for the one hot encoding. Again, this is where the our our extra data from our data loader comes in handy. Um, so simply calling the evaluate method for for this one will further increase the number of X features we have. Um, so it, we're sort of maintaining this X and Y data frame uh, throughout the notebook. Um, and so now, if we examine our X feature matrix, we see that um, now we have four hundred nineteen columns as it added fifteen one hot encoded columns. Um, Every time that you run a different uh, module like this, a new folder is created. So if we go back to our MassML Tutorial 3 folder, we see that we now have a one hot group generator column that was made as well. Um, so now that we have a large number of features, we have more features than data points. Um, that's a, certainly probably too many. Um, and so what we want to do, sorry about that. What we want to do is uh, first pre-process our features so that they're sort of more amenable to using machine learning models. Uh, and then we want to uh, select features that are most important for a particular model. Uh, this will also help us avoid overfitting concerns. Um, so there are different ways to normalize your data. So right now our data has you know, units associated with it because they're physical values. Um, and so we want to normalize everything in this particular case so that every feature has a mean value of zero and a standard deviation of one. Uh, so this puts all of our different uh, you know, physical feature values on sort of the same numerical distribution. Um, so to do that, we can define a preprocessor um, and we have a sort of a wrapper class called sklearn preprocessor, which will uh, be used to use any of the scikit-learn compatible preprocessing. In this case, we're using uh, the standard scalar preprocessor. So all you have to do is sort of pass the string name of the preprocessor method in here. For instance, another one may be the min max scalar. So if you wanted to use that, you would just write min max scalar here instead of standard scalar. Um, so this is simply just the definition of the preprocessor instance. And then to run it, um, sort of as in the case of the feature generator methods, we just call preprocessor.evaluate um, and pass in the X and Y data and the save path. Um, and it will normalize all of our input data. Um, as with before, this will, if we look back at our save data, you can see that the standard scalar folder just popped up. Um, and so we have the, um, the pickled standard scalar method that we can use on other data if we wish, because it was fit to this particular data set, uh, and then the preprocessed data file. Um, so now that we have that, um, you know, we can just quickly inspect our data and see now the numerical ranges of all these values you know, were very different from what they were before. Um, and just as a quick check, we can look at the mean and standard deviation of one of our features and see that it is indeed, you know, effectively zero and one for the mean and standard deviation. Um, so as I mentioned before, we have 419 features and that is uh, almost certainly um, going to result in overfitting of a model. Um, and so as one example of feature selection here, what we can do is select features using an ensemble model like random forest regression. 
Um, these are nice because they uh, provide you feature importance rankings, which can then be used to select the, sort of the most important features um, that may be used in your model. Um, so here, uh, to, get, to uh, specify a model, we have an sklearn model wrapper, much like the sklearn preprocessor, where we can define a random forest model with, with a single line. Um, and then we also can define our selector instance as ensemble model feature selector. Um, there are, you know, half dozen or so other methods of feature selection. Um, besides this one of which is detailed below, which I'll simply talk about but not run because it takes more time. Um, but all we need is to pass in our model instance and the number of features we want. And like in the pre-processing and feature generator case, we simply call uh, instance.evaluate with the um, necessary input values, and it will use a random forest model to pick out the top 20 features from that set of 419 that we made. Um, so it's done. And we can see that once again, we have this output folder. Uh, in this case, we have um, you know information of the selected features and the rankings of feature importances um, that we can use. Um, so if we, you know, once again, just look at our X feature data, we see that we now only have a set of, should be 408 by 20. So we have our selected feature set. Um, and we could use this directly to start fitting models, which we'll do in a few minutes. What I want to do first is just um, one other piece of analysis, which is to examine how well our model, uh, in this case, random forest may work um, sort of as a function of number of features, because I just chose 20, right? It could be a different number that is sort of um, better or worse for this particular situation. Um, so to do that, we have a learning curve module. Um, again, we can just call its evaluate function as in the other cases. All it takes is our model of interest, the X and Y data, and some kind of feature selector. So in this particular case, I'm going to make a learning curve using random forest and an ensemble model feature selector. Um, so there's any number of combinations you could try, right? You could do, um, you could look at the performance of a neural network using forward selection or sort of a, uh, a univariate feature selection method. Um, so there are a number of possibilities. I just have one shown here. Um, so if we run this, it will just take, um, take a few seconds. It will actually generate two types of learning curves. Um, it will generate model performance as a function of number of data points. So you can sort of see like what might happen to your model performance if more or less data is used. It might motivate acquisition of additional data. And it will also examine model performance versus number of features. So you can sort of gauge whether you have sort of saturated your model performance with respect to feature size or whether more or fewer may be needed. Um, so I've just shown blown ups here of, here, I'll just try to zoom out a little bit, it's too big. Um, so this plot is, uh, you know, mean absolute error of training in blue and then validation in red um, uh, versus number of training data points where this sort of shaded region is a standard deviation from, from cross validation of a particular data set. Um, so you know, we can see that uh, you know, sort of as expected, the model performance is getting marginally better with increasing data, but, but perhaps saturating. Um, but in general, this data set is only a little over 400 values, right? So it's rather small. Um, so more data might be useful down the line. Um, and then sort of more interesting is looking at model performance with respect to number of features selected. If we again look at the validation curve in the red, what we can see is pretty steady model improvement up till about, you know, 12, 11, 12 features. And that's basically flat. So I selected 20 features before, but you know, one may argue that it may actually be beneficial in this particular case to actually restrict our number of features to be more like say 11 or 12. Um, so I think the learning curve is done. So again, if we go back to our save folder, we have this learning curve folder where we have these particular uh, you know, images and, and data, data files that I mentioned previously. Um, and again, your, your particular results may vary from what's shown here because these are static images from a previous run that I did. Um, so one thing I'm not going to run, but I'm just going to briefly discuss, which is using um, forward selection to select features. So the forward selection process basically chooses the single best feature that describes the data and then iteratively goes through all the remaining features to predict to um, 
generate the feature set that, that predicts the um, target data the best. Um, so this is a much more computationally intensive process and can also be used with, with any given model of interest. So I'm not going to run this cell, but just simply describe it here, um, where we can use a sequential feature selection model um, and our random forest regressor to, to make a learning curve. Um, for this particular case, I only went up to 10 features, but the behavior is slightly different from the previous case, where here we have sort of a more continuous decrease of the validation score with number of features. Um, and at least from my personal experience, what tends to happen is that uh, the sort of you know, iterative forward selection of features can result in um, uh, more uh, in models with with better performance because it basically um, selects the more important set of features compared to using ensemble methods. Um, but you know that will vary based on particular application and data set that you're using. Um, so that's sort of, sort of a very brief overview of you know taking in some data, generating, selecting, normalizing features assessing performance with learning curves. Um, and what I want to do now actually is move on to this tutorial four down here, where we start um, examining fits of some different model types to, um, to our data. Um, and so what um, one thing actually to do here is there is one particular um, package uh, called XG boost or extreme gradient boosting that we use in this tutorial. Um, and just as a slight software hiccup, what, what will uh, benefit you to make this work is to actually just go up to kernel and uh, restart and clear your output. So this will actually just sort of remove the imported modules from your from your use session. And that's just because we need to do this import XGBoost first. Um, so if we just import packages here, um, again, we're just importing some, uh, you know, different MassML modules to be able to do some, some model fitting here. I've defined a new safe path where we have this uh, tutorial for models and tests. So all of the model tests and evaluation for this part of the tutorial will be saved in a different safe path um, than what we had for the feature generation and selection part. Um, so this, this next cell is just importing data. Again, this is basically identical in its use from what I showed before. We're just importing a different file where we file where we had this diffusion data, but with a, a pre-selected feature set that we can use. Um, so now our, our X feature set will be slightly different from what we just generated before. Um, for this particular case, I just defined five models that are sort of canonical in their use and, and are often evaluated to see what, what might perform best. As a very simple case, I have linear regression um, for a couple uh, uh, kernel methods, we have kernel ridge regression or the Gaussian kernel, Gaussian process regression, and then random forest ensemble method that we looked at before, and then a basic neural network model. Um, each model in, in MassML can be defined basically by a one-liner using the sklearn model class, as we showed before. Um, in any case, the way that you use this is that you just specify the model name as a string, so that the name of, of the linear regressor model is, is just linear regression. Uh, and then any keyword arguments that follow that are automatically built into the scikit-learn model. So for instance, for kernel ridge, the default parameter for the kernel is a linear kernel. Um, and so if I specified nothing here and just had kernel ridge, it would use a linear kernel. Um, but here we can specify keyword arguments like kernel and use a, what's called a radial basis function kernel or a Gaussian kernel. Um, so similar, you know, with Gaussian process regression, we can specify our kernel. Um, with the MLP regressor, that's the neural network in scikit-learn, we can specify you know, our hidden layer sizes for our architecture. Um, so we can just define these models, each as a one-liner. Um, MassML actually will take a list of models because what it'll do for any particular cross-validation test is evaluate um, all of these models for, for a particular test of interest. So we can just make a list of models here. Um, as before, we can define our preprocessor with how to normalize our input data. We're going to use standard scalar again. So this is just a definition. Um, and then what we can do is, is designate which metrics, which statistical metrics we want to evaluate for our model. Um, we're going to look at, you know, a select few that I tend to like to look at are the, the R2 score, mean absolute error, root mean squared error, and then the very useful root mean squared error divided by standard deviation, which is basically just a normalized RMSE. Um, 
So this first example actually is uh, a case of what I call what we call a no split, which is it will fit on all of the data. Um, so that might sound a little peculiar, right? Because you'll have overfitting, but that's often what you want to do in the end when you have sort of your, your final uh, model of interest. I'm actually going to skip this for now and go down to this later cell where we have um, a basic cross validation test. Um, so as with other modules, we can we have a one line definition of of this module of sklearn data splitter. Um, so here is you know how you specify tests to split up your data and evaluate your model. Um, aside from just fitting and predicting on all of your data, the simplest thing you can do is sort of a random leave out cross validation method. Um, so here we use a uh, k-fold cross validation where we have a single repeat, so it's conducted one time, and we have five splits, so it's it's basically like five-fold cross validation or leave out twenty percent. Um, as with our other methods, there's an evaluate call that we that we put on this, um, and there's a number of parameters. But suffice it to say, for this, what we give is our x and y input data, the models we want to evaluate, the preprocessor we want to use, the metrics we want to evaluate, the types of of plots to make. Here I've designated scatter scatter plots and histograms, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and then the safe path of where to put it uh, and, and so forth. Um, so I'll just run this quick. Um, it will take a couple of minutes because it's doing five-fold cross-validation on all five of those models. Um, uh, so in addition to this and what's shown in a later tutorial is you could also specify uh, a feature selector method and a hyperparameter optimization method. And what Massimo will do is it will perform your cross-validation. Um, and for every split, it will select features, you know, normalize your data appropriately, select features, optimize the hyperparameters of the model you give it, and then evaluate you know, the train test splits and generate the statistics and plots of interest for you automatically. Um, and then based on all the splits that are performed, it will actually pick out the best model based on the lowest error metric that you give it. Um, so it'll sort of just give you like, this is the best overall model for the test and data that you gave me. Um, so this will take a couple of minutes to get through, um, but I can briefly sort of talk about the output structure and what's included. Um, so like the other um, tests that we saw earlier, um, every model and every data split you run has its own folder. Um, the naming convention is uh, such that you have um, the model name, the data splitter type, the preprocessor that you used, and then the feature selector that you used. In this case, we didn't use feature selection. We just fit to all the features that we had that we imported, um, and then a timestamp. So in here, since we did five-fold cross-validation, we have a, a split folder for each of the five splits. And then sort of at this uh, you know, one level up folder, we have a number of um, uh, data files and uh, analysis plot. So for instance, this parity plot test that I have, which basically just gives you a plot of the predicted versus true values and the four statistics of interest that I, four metrics that I've designated before. Um, so what we can do is we can go back to our folder from our, our Jupyter environment. If you go out to this main folder, what you'll see is, we, you know, we now have this ASML tutorial four that we defined. And then in here is a folder for each of the models that we're running five-fold cross-validation on. So if we just look at, say, the Kernel Ridge model, under each split, again, we have the fitted model and then a number of, of uh, data files, like what data you trained on, what was in the test and train, um, and uh, um, analysis files. So for this one split, for instance, there's uh, you know histograms of residuals. There is um, parity plots of train and test data. And again, this is just for one split, so we just have a, a small amount of data. Ah, wait, there we go. Um, and then if we go one level up, we have the uh, plots, say, over all of the splits averaged out and so forth. So you can see some of these more aggregate statistics that you get from, from your full splitting procedure. Um, so this is a very uh, sort of flexible type of um, uh, uh, module in that, you know, there, there's a number of permutations one can do. You can change the model type you're using. You can change the way you select features. You can change the data splitting test you're doing. So instead of randomly leaving out data, maybe you want to leave out 
certain groups. Um, so if you may recall, when we imported data, we had that groups information labels. Um, so with that, you can pass that directly to a leave out group test and you can perform that uh, later on in this tutorial, actually. I'm not gonna show it in real time because it does take a few minutes to run through. Um, but we've tried to make it as easy as possible to do these sort of different statistical tests in a robust way. Um, so what I'm going to uh, briefly talk about now is, uh, well, first what I showed here were just, you know, I, I put in parity plots of these for each of the models to, to sort of see at a glance which one performed best. Um, so for instance, this is the one for Gaussian process regression. I had one for kernel ridge, which we looked at. And so uh, linear regression is not so good. Um, so from this, you can immediately see, you know, certain model types that perform more or less well for the particular data set that you're using. Again, the, the exact plots you get here will look slightly different for your case because I just, I had uh, pasted these in from a previous run. Um, at least from this particular case, I found that Gaussian process regression performed the best um, and random forest was, was very close, but second best. Um, so what I'm going to just briefly say here is a couple other examples of types of models that you can run besides sort of these, um, you know, basic scikit-learn models that we just looked at. Um, one thing that's interesting is these sort of general bootstrapped ensemble uh, models. So the random forest model that we ran before is a bootstrapped ensemble of decision trees where each sort of, you know, sub model is an individual decision tree. Um, but you can actually, you know, sort of generalize this to have a bootstrapped ensemble of any model you want. Uh, and one reason that's useful, not only from the standpoint of building more robust models, but will allow you to do more robust uncertainty quantification from bootstrapped uncertainties. Um, that's sort of a whole other area of discussion and runs that one can do in MassML. Uh, it is part of the tutorial six in this tutorial tool. Um, so I won't be able to do it in real time today, but if you're interested in um, you know, more uh, quantified ways of estimating model uncertainties, I'd encourage you to look there. Um, but what we show here in task 4.2 is actually building an ensemble of neural networks um, where we can define an ensemble model again with this uh, with just a one liner where we make a bootstrap ensemble of 100 individual neural networks, the given uh, uh, size. Um, and like before, you can run repeated k fold cross validation or whatever data splitter type you want with other configurations with this ensemble model. Um, and we could, it just here, if we look at the performance difference, this was the parity plot from a single neural network from the previous run at a root mean square error of like 0.214 electron volts. Um, by comparison, the ensemble of neural networks performs much better. This is because you essentially have 100 neural networks, uh, you know, voting on what the value should be in average for every particular data point. Um, so the root mean square error drops substantially to like 0.153. Um, so you could do an ensemble of Gaussian process regression models or, you know, whatever you want, um, but sort of a sort of a, a powerful method of building bootstrap model ensembles. Um, so in addition to the, you know, typical scikit-learn models, MassML also has, uh, you know, the very popular XGBoost uh, model package or extreme gradient boosting. Um, so in task 4.3, what we walk through is just comparing Psychic learns gradient boosting method with the extreme gradient boosting method. Um, for, for the particular example I did, they were about the same, but I've run it at various times and found XGBoost to be better. Um, so if you're interested, you can play with that yourself. But uh, you know, in many instances, XGBoost tends to outperform uh, typical gradient boosting methods. Um, as one final thing, um, you know, we have full support for you know custom neural networks built through Keras. Um, so Keras is, for those who don't know, it's it's basically a more user-friendly front end for building TensorFlow-based uh, neural network models. So it allows for extremely flexible generation of different types of neural network architectures. Um, so the way that we do this actually um, is it's slightly more complex than a single one-line function call. But basically what you can do is you can build a model, I just called mine Keras model here, a model function that defines your model architecture. So I defined a model architecture that was the same as the scikit-learn model that we built before. Um, and then you can instantiate your model with our Keras regressor function. Um, and uh, what I show here in the tutorial is actually just running our, our five-fold cross-validation method. 
um, between this sort of keras regressor neural network with the scikit-learn neural network uh, and comparing their performance, we see, again, this was the scikit-learn model from before, and we see that the, psych that the keras neural network um, performed much better. Um, so this is just another example of sort of comparing head-to-head -head models of, of similar types. Um, uh, so as I mentioned before, we have some examples of comparing model performance with different types of cross-validation. The remainder of this particular tutorial examines um, random cross-validation versus leave-out group cross-validation. Um, the leave-out group cross-validation is typically a more demanding test of your model performance because the test data tends to be um, it can be outside the domain of the training data, depending on how you segment your groups, but it's, um, you know, it's drawn from a different, different distribution than the training data, whereas randomly segmenting your data tends to have extremely similar distributions of training and test data. And so your um, model ends up having a more demanding test put upon it, and so your uh, prediction statistics tend to be worse. Um, and that's not all bad, because if you plan on using your model for, say, in this case of the of the alloy um, diffusion, we might be interested in what a brand new host that we have not calculated in our database may perform. And if we use random cross validation to assess that error, it's going to be a sort of a very uh, optimistic est estimate of the error. And in fact, will be wrong. It will be underestimated um, because random cross validation is not how we will be using the model in practice. Um, and so things like leave out group cross validation can be useful in this way to sort of have a, a more uh, realistic estimation of, of how your model will perform based on how you want to use it in your application. Um, so I know that we have about 10 minutes left, so I want to just briefly talk about a few of the other capabilities that MassML has. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually go to tutorial five um, and just briefly talk through a few of the things that we have here. Um, most of these runs will sort of take several minutes or more and a little bit hard to do uh, live here. Um, but one thing I haven't really touched on is, you know, how do you optimize your model parameters or your hyperparameters? Uh, and then how do I efficiently make predictions on left out data that I haven't had in my training set? Um, so we have methods to do that that, that can be outlined here in, in this fifth part of the tutorial. Um, there's actually two ways to assess performance on left out data. There's sort of a manual way and an automatic way. The manual way is to actually designate in your data file specific data points that should be left out from training altogether and then used as sort of like prediction or test data. Um, so that can be directly implemented from our data loader object as um, like a test data column. So I had in this particular um, test data file. I had all of the values where the host element was platinum. I had those left out data. Um, and then we train and validate models on all the rest and left out data is always platinum. So um, what we do in this particular tutorial is just build a kernel ridge model to predict the values of platinum as if that's our left out data. Um, and what we find is a parity plot that looks something like this. Um, if you might recall from our previous fits, this you know root mean square error is higher than than what we had from random cross validation. Again, that makes sense because we've sort of left out this entire element group from our fit. Um, so there's no information about platinum in our fit whatsoever. Um, but nevertheless, it does a, does a decent job. Um, so this is fit on a kernel ridge model from you know, a scikit learned kernel ridge model with no hyperparameter optimization. So this actually isn't the best model that we can use to predict our platinum values. Um, and what we show here is a way to. Um, implement uh, both nested cross-validation and then also hyperparameter optimization to build a model that, that more um, accurately describes um, the platinum values. So I'm actually just going to scroll down to show you what the plot looks like. Um, so you know, as with our other methods, we can define hyperparameter optimizations through a single call to, in this case, a, a grid search method. There are other more um, sort of mathematically smart search methods like randomized search or, or Bayes, Bayesian based search methods. Um, but what I did for this case was I simply gridded, gridded the space of, of the alpha parameter for kernel ridge regression um, uh, to build an optimized model with k-fold cross-validation. Um, so for every split, it will predict 
you know, not just the test data in that split, but our left out platinum data every time. Uh, and so before we had that root mean square error that was like 0.277 EV or so, um, this was like the original plot. Uh, but when we optimize our hyperparameters and then use the best model, now you see that the predictions are, are improved dramatically. Um, so this was uh, automatically done. Um, and so when you did five-fold cross-validation, it will build the optimized models for every split. It'll choose the best model and then use that model to predict your left out data and generate plots like this. Um, so this is sort of, you know, the case where I manually held out data and I knew what I wanted. Um, but in the, in the case where you might want to do that many, many times, say, um, we have an automatic method of nested cross-validation, which will um, build those left out data splits automatically and then iteratively do this process of model training and validation, choosing the best model and predicting the left out data points. Um, so, you know, implementing nested cross-validation is actually as simple as a single flag in the data splitter. Um, so this was, you know, using our repeated k-fold data splitter from before. Um, and all we have to do is switch nested cross-validation equal to true, and it will perform five-fold cross-validation in a nested sense. So in this particular case, instead of having five splits together, it'll have 25 um, because it's sort of a two-level process of, you know, train validation, test data, and then for every test data set, it's doing cross-validation. Um, so this is a method to easily implement um, this type of nested cross-validation. Um, and then just one more thing before we wrap up is I do want to talk about um, this model error analysis and uncertainty quantification. This has been, I feel like, a push in the materials community. People are really starting to, uh, you know, give this more attention, the attention that it deserves. And, you know, we want MassML to be useful for broad members of the community in ways that not only make it easy, but, you know, useful to their particular uh, case that they need it for. And so we're, we do identify a need for understanding and quantifying the error in our models and the domain of applicability of our models and having automatic methods telling you when you might be outside of your domain and thus, you know, your model might not be fully trustworthy. Um, and so we have different ways of visualizing and implementing this. And this is very much a work in progress. Um, but one particular um, visualization that I have found very informative is actually this plot here. Um, and what this does, we call it a residual versus error plot. This can be generated automatically through MassML through, through the error uh, plot flag. Um, but it, it essentially takes all of your residual values, so the actual errors, true minus predicted values, and an estimation of your model error based on this bootstrap resampling method that I discussed before, and turns it into this tidy plot of normalized values where we sort of bind. So, so if you were just to plot the data, it would just be data points everywhere. It'd be very messy. Um, what we can do is plot these values as the root mean square of a particular bin and look at the correlation between your actual error and your predicted error. Um, and in this particular case, what's interesting is that the predicted error um, is actually overestimating the true error. What we would like is we would like these data to be right on this 45 degree line where for errors that you have that are large, you have large error bars and are, are at least accurate. Um, and so with this, we've proposed sort of a rescaling scheme where we can take your model errors and rescale them to be much closer to this 45 degree line and hence give you more accurate uncertainty estimates for your model. Um, so that, that's, that's uh, gone over in depth here in this last tutorial. Um, and so as an example, um, between the sort of uncalibrated through the same data I showed before and the recalibrated uncertainty estimates based on, um, based on our method, we can sort of provide more accurate uncertainty estimates for bootstrapped ensemble models. Um, but that's sort of a, a rather in-depth topic that, that deserves more discussion later. Um, so I think this is a, a natural stopping point. Um, and if you find it useful, I do encourage you all to, to go through the other tutorials at, at your own pace. Um, we're very uh, keen to have user feedback. And uh, so please feel free to either email me or drop us a note uh, like as a GitHub issue or so forth, because our goal is really to have 
this tool as it evolves to be useful for the community and adopted by a wide number of users. And so if we're not meeting a specific use case, then that's something that we should try to take on. Um, so I really do welcome that, that feedback and, and suggestions. Um, you know, with that, um, thank you all for listening. I hope it was informative and useful. Um, and I can stick around and help answer questions as well. Okay, well, uh, Ryan, thank you very much. Uh, this was an awesome presentation. It was certainly informative and useful. Uh, I know there's been quite a bit of back and forth in the Q&A. Um, and, and one question that at least I can see the answer. Sometimes I think the answers are, are private, but um, one of the questions that remains there seems to be, can you motivate the selection of random forest regre regressor for feature selection a little more? Oh, as in like why someone would want to do that? Yeah, well, I think the, uh, the way I understand the question is why random forests? Yeah. Um, so let me just try to open up the Q&A here. Yeah, so I guess in general, some of these tree-based methods like random forest, um, I think you can do it with uh, gradient boosting as well. But um, you know, so when the when the trees are, are made to, to do these fits, they, um, and if you give it too many features, say it'll sort of naturally um, weight more important features um, relative to others. And so it's sort of a, things like random forest can be sort of a natural feature selection method. Um, and so instead of giving it like 500 features where the weights of 400 of them are near zero, you can sort of rank what the model thinks are the important features and then use that as a scheme to select the most important features. So if you were to open up that feature importances file, you know, you would see like the top few might be, you know, 5% importance, say, uh, and then they, they will trail off in, in terms of their importances. And so you can use, you can use these tree-based methods in, in this way as a method of feature selection. Um, I, I hope that makes sense, but. Um... Yeah. So uh, there's, there's more questions. Uh, let's do one more maybe. Um, uh, how reliable are the features generated by the uh, MassML library with respect to the actual values? Not quite sure I understand the question. Yeah, so there's no like predicted versus actual comparison to make for the feature generation scheme. I mean, that's just a method of generating X values for your model to fit to, right? Um, so, yeah, not not quite sure how to address that either. Um, so there, there's more questions coming, um, okay. yeah, but we're we're over the hour. Thanks everyone for participating. Thanks Ryan for a, a great seminar, and I hope to see you all next week. Very nicely yeah. done.